Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Superhouse. One of the most common things you'll have to do in a home automation system or any IoT sort of project is take data from a sensor, store it, and then produce some kind of a report or a chart. What we're going to be looking at here is output from the particulate matter sensor, the air quality sensor. But it could be temperature or humidity or stock prices. It really doesn't matter. In order to do this, we're going to need four different software components. First, we need something to receive the messages from the sensor. We're going to use a message broker. This gives us a universal way of taking data from all sorts of different sensors. We also need a database to store the data for future reference so that we're not just looking at the latest value, we can look back in time. Now, typically from the message broker, you won't be able to get the message directly into the database. So we need some kind of a data bridge which is going to see the data coming in and then store it in the database. Finally, we need to do something with the data, so we're going to use a charting system. We'll take the data from the database and generate charts of the values over time. Each of these four building blocks has many different alternatives that you could use. For this example, I'm going to use the Mosquito MQTT message broker, Node Red, for the data bridge. We're going to store the data in the InfluxDB database, and we're going to chart it using Grafana. We also need a computer or hardware to run all of this on. There are many different ways you could set this up. This could be across multiple machines, it could be hosted in the cloud, but for this example, I'm going to go simple. We're just going to use a Raspberry Pi and install everything on the same device. So to get started, set up a Raspberry Pi with a basic Raspbian installation, and then we're going to take it from there and install all the different components that we need to set up the data logging system. Raspbian has recently been renamed Raspberry Pi OS, and it now has this really handy utility, the Raspberry Pi Imager. All you have to do is put an SD card in your computer, run the Imager, and select which operating system you want. You don't even need to download it first because the Imager does it for you. Then select the SD card, click Write, and then just wait 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the size of your card and the speed. You can then take the SD card out of your computer, put it into the Raspberry Pi, power it up and you're ready to go. There is excellent documentation on the Raspberry Pi site to get you going. So follow the instructions until you've got your Raspberry Pi connected to the network and you've got yourself a shell. I'm going to rush through these next few instructions fairly quickly. It's hard to follow on video anyway, but on the Superhouse page for this episode, there will be all of the commands. You can just copy and paste them. It makes it really easy. The very first thing to do is check what IP address has been assigned to your Raspberry Pi. You'll need this later, so type ifconfig, have a look for the IP address, and make a note of it. With the Raspberry OS set up, we need to install an MQTT broker, and for that we're going to use Mosquito. Use apps to install both the Mosquito broker and the Mosquito client. The client will be really useful later when we want to do some testing. You can leave your broker with the default installation with no username and password, but let's set one up just to make the system a little bit more secure. We'll start by putting a username and password into a text file, and then we'll run the utility that encrypts it. What this does is take the plain text file and convert it into an encrypted version. Then we need to move it into the correct place in the configuration directory for Mosquito. We also have to edit the Mosquito configuration. We'll disable anonymous access. This forces use of the password file. Then we'll tell Mosquito where it can find the file. Finally, we need to restart Mosquito so that it will load our new configuration. We can check whether this worked by using the Mosquito client to try to connect to the broker. I've used the minus V flag for verbose and the minus T flag for the topic. I'm just using the hash wildcard as the topic name so we're listening to everything. If the connection is rejected, it means a password is now required and our configuration changes have worked. So then we can try connecting with the username and password that we set, and the connection should succeed. You won't see anything because nothing is being published to the broker right now. When the data comes in, we need somewhere to store it. We're going to put it in a time series database, so we'll use InfluxDB. To install InfluxDB, we can use its official repository, where the developers have provided packages specifically for different operating systems on the Raspberry Pi. Start by fetching the official repository key and adding it to the local keyring. Now you can add the repository. 
there are a few different versions available, so you need to copy and paste the command that matches your operating system. Now that the repository has been added, we need to update the list of packages that are available. Just do sudo apt update and then sudo apt install influxdb. This will pull down the influxdb package and install it with the default configuration. Next we'll tell the system control service manager to enable influxdb at startup. Start influxdb manually this time. In future it will be started automatically whenever your Raspberry Pi boots up. Let's set up access control for influxdb before we do anything else. The default installation of influxdb leaves the system wide open, so we'll start by creating an admin user and setting a password. Connect to influxdb by running the client. We don't need to use a username or password this time, because nothing has been set yet. Create a user called admin and put in the password you want to use for it. Now you can exit out of influxdb. Simply type exit and press enter. The influxdb configuration needs to be edited so that it will use authentication. Otherwise the admin user that we just created will be ignored. Use a text editor to open the influxdb config file. Search for the section called HTTP and then paste in these four lines. You can copy them from the Superhouse site. Save your changes and exit. The config change won't be applied until influxdb has been restarted, so restart it manually. From now on, any time you want to connect to the influxdb command line, you will need to supply the username and password. We need to do that now, so connect like this, but use the password you just set. If the previous change has worked, you should now be connected to influxdb again, and authenticated as the admin user that you just created. Next we need to tell influxdb to create a database where we can store sensor data. In this example I've simply called the database Sensors, and that's all there is to it. Because of the way influxdb works, there's no need to create a schema with tables and columns, like you would with a relational database such as MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, or SQL Server. All you need to do is create an empty database, and it will be automatically populated when you start sending data to it. Leave the influxdb client by typing exit, as usual. To take the data that arrives via MQTT and put it into the database, we need some kind of a bridge. We're going to use Node-RED for that. There are several different ways to install Node-RED and it's readily available in the Raspberry OS packaging system. However, the Node-RED team recommend that you do not use the packaged version. Instead, they provide a handy script that installs the latest official released version of Node-RED and helps you keep it updated. Before running the Node-RED installation script, install the tools needed by NPM to build binary modules. Now you can run the official Node-RED installation script just paste it on the command line. The script will ask you whether you are sure you want to proceed and whether to install Pi specific nodes. Just say yes to both questions. Running the installer takes a few minutes, so I'm fast forwarding through this section now. Just be patient and let it work. When the script is finished, Node Red will be installed. But just like with InfluxDB, you need to configure it to be automatically started on boot. Type sudo system control enable node service. You can start the service manually this time, but in future it will happen automatically when your Pi starts up. And finally, once we've got data in the database, we need to be able to display it. That's where Grafana comes in. Just like with InfluxDB, we can install Grafana by adding the official repository and installing the package. Start by fetching the public key for the repository and adding it to the local keyring. Now add the repository itself. Update the package list again and install the Grafana package. Just like the other packages we've installed, we need to enable the service using system control so that it will start automatically. That takes care of starting Grafana at boot. For now, let's start it manually. We've just spent an awfully long time looking at consoles, copying and pasting commands, but from here on, pretty much everything is graphical. We're going to be able to use a web browser to configure those different software components and make them talk to each other. But before we do, we need to get some device that's going to send data to it so that we can see what's going on. So what we're going to do is set up the air quality sensor and configure it to publish to MQTT. From that point, we can do everything we want to do through a web browser. At the start of this video, I said that devices typically use one of two methods to report values to MQTT. They can either report specific values just as they are directly to topics, or they can combine values into a big JSON string and then report that so that it can be separated at the other end. 
The firmware for the air quality sensor project incorporates both methods, so it's a really good one to understand how this works. Let's have a look. What do you see here in the configuration file are options for separate reporting and JSON reporting. I've got them both turned on so we can see both formats. Then if we look in the source code, I've already been through this in the past in a different video, but let's just have a look through. So if we skim, skim down here through the source code, we can see that what we're going to be doing is setting up topics for the individual values. And then we also set up a topic for the JSON response. Now what that means is we have the option of either subscribing to each of the topics individually and each one will just have a number in it, which is the value for that topic. Or we can subscribe to the JSON topic and then we'll get all the values combined into a single JSON object and then we can decode that. If we jump over onto the terminal on our broker, we can use mosquito sub to subscribe, but we need to set a username because we've configured that in our configuration file and we can't get on without it. And we need to pass the password as well. If I can type this correctly, I'll get it there eventually. And I'm going to set the minus V flag for verbose so that we can see the topic that is being published to, not just the value. Now I'm going to subscribe to the wildcard topic here so that we can see everything. And this way we will be able to see every single message that is published to this broker. We'll see the topic that it's been published to and the value. And that way we can see what's coming back from the air quality sensor. So we'll turn on the power and see what happens. First up, we can see that the device is published to the events topic. The first thing here is the topic name, and then everything that follows it is a message that's been published. And in this particular firmware, I've just got it reporting its startup events to the events topic. That way we can watch the events topic and see when devices join the network. And look, now you can see that it's published some values. You can see that it's Tele for telemetry. There is the unique value for the ID of this particular device. And then AE1P0. So that's the atmospheric environment particles 1.0. And there is a count of one. You can see here that there are three topics that have been published to, and they have just a numeric value in them. And then you can see there is another topic, which ends in slash sensor. So this is the exact same information, it's just that instead of publishing the values directly to individual topics, it's wrapping it all up in a big chunk of JSON and reporting it as a single thing on one topic. So now we know that our air quality sensor is reporting those values to the broker. Anything that needs to get access to that information can subscribe to those topics, and it will see whenever updates come from the sensor. The same principle applies for all sorts of sensors. It doesn't have to be just air quality sensors. This could be temperature sensors, or it really doesn't matter. Anything that publishes values to the broker, we can now access. So the next step is to look into Node-RED and how we're going to access the information that's coming in on MQTT. From here on, we're doing everything in a web browser. So open a new browser window and go to the IP address of your Raspberry Pi, whatever device is running Node-RED. Then put colon 1880 on the end. That's the port number that it uses. When you load that page, it'll start off totally blank like this with the default setup. There will be a single flow called flow one. There are some nodes down the left here. There is nothing set up here at all. The very first thing we need to do is add support for InfluxDB. Come up to the little hamburger menu up in the top right, go to Manage Palette, and we're going to go to Install and search for InfluxDB. And the very first result here is Node Red Contrib InfluxDB. That's what we want. Click on Install, and Install, and away we go. This will add support for InfluxDB to your Node Red installation, and then we can add nodes for storing data into the database and getting it back out if we want to. It's now added a few nodes to the palette. So we can close this. We're back at the flow, which is still blank. And we want to start pulling in some data. On the left here where we've got these nodes, we'll scroll down and let's start with an MQTT in. We'll grab this one because what we want to do is subscribe to the MQTT topic that is publishing some data. Now double click on that node to set the configuration. And you can see here it asks us to add a new MQTT broker. That's because we haven't actually connected this installation to the broker at all yet. When you are setting up MQTT in Node-RED, there are two different things that you need to configure in the node. One is the connection to the broker, and the second is the subscription to the specific topic. 
Now, once you've configured a broker, you can use it multiple times. You only need to do that once. So let's do that here and then we'll have it available forever. Click on the little pencil icon next to add new MQTT broker. And I'm just going to give it localhost as the server name. Let's just call it MQTT broker for now. If you have multiple brokers, you can put those in here. And because I'm running everything on the same device, we can just say localhost. If you're running a separate MQTT broker somewhere else on your network or using an external broker, you can put the IP address or the host name in here. And we'll just leave everything else the same. So auto generate a client ID, leave use clean session turned on, keep alive 60 seconds, that's all fine. Click on add. And now we've got MQTT broker in our list. If we go to the drop down, you can see that there is just that single MQTT broker, or we can add a new one. We don't need a new one, we just want to subscribe to our topic next. So if we flip to our terminal that we were looking at a moment ago, you can see that there are these topics with the values coming in. So how about we grab this one? This is a topic that we want to subscribe to. So I'm going to put this in here and we are going to give this a name of PPD0P3 and hit done. And this will now connect to MQTT and subscribe to that topic. It's not going to do anything yet. We could actually deploy this, but there's no point because the output of this subscription is not being used. Let's just add a debug node and see what's going on. We'll put a debug node in here, connect them together, click on deploy, and this will take these changes and make them live. You can see here it says disconnected. And that's because we didn't set up any authentication. So let's go back into here and we will edit this MQTT broker go into the security tab and add the username. MQTT username. Now, of course, this should actually be a secure username and password, but in our case, I'm just using this as an example. And done, and now it says connecting. And in a moment, we should see that it will connect successfully. Now, let's just click on deploy. Oh, here we go. See, it says connected. So now we know that it is connected to the broker and it's authenticated. Now, if we come over to the debug messages, oh, look at this, we've already got a message that's come in. So this little debugging node here, which is outputting information to the console, has said that on Tello 3C F032 slash PPD 0P3, the payload was 147. Now, if we switch back to our console, we should see that the last message was 147. So our node red system is now successfully receiving the data that is coming in via MQTT. And we can do something useful with it if we want to. So at this point, what you could do is use that logic to set off some automation. You could create a node, for example, which looks at the value coming in. And if it's above a certain threshold, it sends off a command to start an air purifier or you know, whatever you want to do, set out a notification. So what this gives us is the ability to take actions based on the data that is coming in from the air quality sensor or the temperature sensor or whatever else you have connected. So instead of just outputting this information to the debug, let's have a look at storing this into InfluxDB. If we scroll down here on the left, this is the list of all the nodes that are available. We will find that there should be an InfluxDB node down here now. And here we go in storage. There's InfluxDB in, InfluxDB out, InfluxDB batch. So now we can make a connection to our InfluxDB database. So we'll grab this InfluxDB out. So we'll double click on InfluxDB. And of course we don't have an InfluxDB connection. So we're going to need to create a new one. We'll just come in here. The database is already set. It's just called database, but no, we want to rename that to sensors because that was the name of the database that we created. We set up a username of just admin and the password was admin password course, you would use something a little bit more secure than that. It's on localhost because we've got all this running on the same machine, so that doesn't need to change. And I'll just click on add. And now that we have the connection to our database set up, what we can do is say what measurement we are wanting to store. Now in this case, what I'm going to do is just name it the same as the topic. And that should be in my history, so I'll just paste that in there. 
and you can see that I've just named it Teller, 3CF, etc, PPD 0P3. And what will I call this? PPD, so parts per deciliter, 0.3. We'll give that the name and done. So what we can do now is just link from the MQTT subscription. We'll click on deploy. And now any data that comes in here will be stored with a timestamp into InfluxDB. And it really is as simple as that. What it comes down to is really just these two nodes. The subscription using MQTT, the data comes out here, and it goes into the connection to InfluxDB. Because we're just dealing with single values, it's really easy. The data is being published as a number. We just take the number, send it to the database, and it stores it for us. We don't need to do any other processing. It's just a link from one to the other. Now that we have this one piece of data coming in from this MQTT topic, we can just duplicate this for as many topics as we need. You can just copy those, put these in here. This is the quickest way to do it. Let's just edit this and we let's pick the 0.5 micron parts per deciliter. I'll just change the topic that it's subscribed to, change the name, and we want to store it into a different location. So let's change the measurement to match the topic name. Click deploy. And now any data that is coming in on those two topics will be stored separately in the database because we've specified a different measurement in Influx for storing the data. Right now though, we are just trusting that this is being stored properly in InfluxDB. You can check if you like. If we switch over to the console on the machine running Influx, then you can just use the Influx command line client. We need to specify a username because we set one up when we were creating this config earlier and the password. And I just made mine admin password in the example. So now we're connected to the InfluxDB database and we're storing everything in the database called sensors. So just say use sensors and that will select the correct database. Now if we just ask the database what measurements it knows about, this will tell us whether we're getting any data going in. Now look, we can see that we've got those two topics. Those are being stored in InfluxDB. So if we want to see what data has been stored coming in from this particular sensor, we can say select star from and then specify the measurement name. So it's going to be Teller, in this case 3CF032, PPD 0P3, which is a bit of a mouthful. And we'll put a limit of, say, five records on it. So there we can see timestamps with the last five records. And that proves basically that we have now got the data coming from the sensor published to MQTT. It's being processed by node red and it's being pushed into influx. So that data is being stored for our future use. But this is still just with those single data points where we are getting a simple number coming in on each topic. What happens if we get a chunk of JSON and it's got multiple values in it? We want to split it up and store it separately. Well, it's not really much harder. Just like with individual values, we want to have a subscription to MQTT. So let's just grab one of these for now. We'll put it in here and then change the settings. We'll open it up and we'll make it subscribe to the sensor topic. And I'll just change the label here as well so we can see the difference. Now what's going to come out of here is a chunk of JSON. So let's grab a JSON parser. We'll drag it in here and we'll take the output from that subscription into the parser. If you open that, you'll see that what it does is convert between a JSON string and a node red object. That makes it really easy to deal with. Now I'm going to reuse this debugging node up here. I'll just take the output from that parser, stick it into message payload, deploy. And now what will happen is that that JSON will come in, be converted to a node red object, and then displayed in the debug window. Because the sensor is only publishing every two minutes, we might have to wait a little while but we'll get a message popping up here in just a moment. Well, there we go. Here in the debug window, you can see the message has come in. We can click this little triangle to spin down the object. And if we dig into it, we can see all of these values being reported. So these are different elements within the message payload. And we can now access these and log them as if they had come in on individual topics. So that way we now have a single topic subscription, which is giving us access to all of that information because it's coming in as a single JSON string. There are a few different ways to pull these individual values out. I'm going to do it using a change node. For now, let's just move this up here, get it out of the way, move message payload up here, and then find the change node. Here we go. 
we'll grab a change node, we'll take the output into here, and then we are going to set a value here. So we want to set the message payload to a specific part of this message. Now if you look across to the right you'll see these three little icons. The first icon is copy path. So if we wanted for example to take out the PB 0.3 just click on copy path and it's now in your clipboard. So over here in the change we can go to message dot and then paste. So we're going to be setting the message payload to message.payload.pms5003 pb3 and I'm going to give it a name so we can see what it is. pb0.3 will do. The result is that the output of this change node is going to be the payload that is just the value we want. So now what we could do is grab another one of these nodes, so this is one of the influxdb nodes, and take that output, store it into influxdb and I'm going to change this one. So I will make this one 0p3. Let's just add a J on the end so that we know which one it is. This is the one from the JSON source. So then we could duplicate that. Let's duplicate these two. Put them in just down below. And this time let's grab out the 0.5. So I'll copy that one. I'll put that in where it's going to be stored, 0.5. We'll store it into the 0.5J location. And take that into there. So what we can do here is just duplicate these for whatever values we want. So for each of the items that's coming in here in the message payload, we can store it individually into InfluxDB. So if we deploy this now, what will happen is that next time this message comes in as a JSON message, these values will be split out and stored into the database. Now using the debug node to find the path to those particular parts of the message is a really handy tip. That's something that I use quite a lot, so keep that in mind. So anytime that you're trying to find content in a message, what you can do is stick a debug node in there, look at the result, you can trace down through the tree to find the part you want, and then copy the path to it. You can then reference that part of the message wherever you want to. Now let's clean this up just so that you can see a summary. I'm going to get rid of these nodes, I'll move these ones up a little bit, and I will get rid of the 0.3 nodes here. So what you have here are examples of the two methods. The first method is for taking values that come in just as a straight value on a topic. You can stick it straight in the database. Or if it comes in as JSON, you can convert it, extract the value you want, and then store it. They both achieve the same end result, but these two patterns can be used wherever you want to store data coming in on MQTT. So now you know how to store the data, it's being put into our InfluxDB database. We need to report on it, and for that we're going to use Grafana. Because we've already installed Grafana, to access it all you need to do is go to the same IP address and go to port 3000 instead of port 1880. It'll come up with a login screen, and the default username and password is just admin and admin. You can change this in the Grafana configuration, but for now it's just the default. The welcome screen gives you access to a tutorial, and it also gives you quick access to the two things you need to do to get started. To use Grafana, you need two things. The first is a connection to a data source. We have InfluxDB, so we're going to link to that. And the second is a dashboard. You can have multiple dashboards, and each dashboard can have different widgets on it. So start by clicking on Add Your First Data Source, and it will take you to this screen. There are many, many different data sources listed. We can just scroll down and select InfluxDB, or you can search for it. There are a few options you'll have to put in here. We'll just leave name as InfluxDB, that will do, InfluxQL. The URL we need to put in as localhost port 8086. So I'll just stick that in there. Leave those sections the same, don't need to change anything here unless you want to customise it. And then we get down to the InfluxDB details. We named our database Sensors, so let's put that in here. And we also gave Influx a username and password. We made it Admin and Admin Password. That should of course be something a bit more secure. So then scroll down and hit Save and Test. And now it says Data Source is working. It's made a test connection to InfluxDB, and we know that that's all sorted. 
So now we have a data source defined and it's just called InfluxDB. So we can reference that from our dashboard. Now just click back up on the icon to go back to the home screen. And you'll see now it says that setting up a data source is complete. We've done our first one. So come across to dashboards, click on create your first dashboard. And we now have a new dashboard. Just click on add panel. And this is the first widget that we are going to put into our dashboard. Now I personally find this particular part of Grafana to be quite confusing. The user interface has lots of configuration options in different locations. So finding what you're looking for can be confusing. But you don't really need to put in too much to get a basic working chart going. So we'll get started and just use the minimum for now. Now the first thing we're going to do is come down to this bottom left area and scroll. You can see there is a section here called Query. This is where we define where it's going to get its data from. There is a single query just called A by default. And it says from default and select measurement. Let's go to select measurement. And here you can see that it's pre-populated the list. These are the measurements that it's detected when it's connected to our InfluxDB database. So for our first chart, let's just pick the 0.3 parts per deciliter. And I'm going to take the J version. This is the one that's coming out of the JSON string. And you can see that now that I've selected it, the chart has already begun to be populated. It looks like a bit of a mess now, and at this resolution it doesn't really show you very much. But we can customize the appearance. So let's come across to the right into this panel area. I'm going to call this PPD, so parts per deciliter. And then we'll scroll down a little bit, and we've got some options here for how it's displayed. If you spin down visualization, you can see it's got a few different varieties here. Graph is what's selected by default, and that's what we want. But just click around a few others and you'll see some other interesting options. You can do it as a stat, which is just the number, as a gauge, as a table, as text, heat map, many different options here. So what we're going to do is leave it as a graph. I'll spin that back up so we can see what's going on. And then we've got some display options. We'll leave this as lines, leave line width as one. But then we've got some other options down here that allow us to change the way this appears. If you look at this, you'll see that it's lots of little points. Each one of those points is a sample. But I want to make this look more like a smooth chart. One of the keys to that is what to do with null values. So if we come down to here as null and change it to connected, you can see that the chart changes from a series of points to a continuous line. And that's because what it does is instead of having no value in between the samples, it links the samples together and makes it look like a nice continuous chart like this. There are a bunch of other options in here as well. You can change things like how intensely the, uh, the area under the chart is filled in, what the line looks like, lots and lots of options. But this is certainly enough for now. And just to show that we can have multiple parameters on the same chart, let's create another query. If we come down here, we've got this first query called A, which is the 0.3 parts per deciliter. And we'll do plus query. We now have one called B. We're going to select a measurement, and in this case, I'm going to take the 0.5 parts per deciliter, once again from the JSON version, and leave everything else the same. And so now we have two values being shown on the chart. And if we come up here, you can see that there is a key. It's got the color and the name. So now we have our values being displayed on the chart. We can just click on apply. And now we're at our dashboard, and we have this widget. And you can see the different values that were being recorded at that particular time. Now what you could do is just add more panels up here and then you can see different values. So you can create charts which combine multiple parameters and you can make individual charts for different things. You can also see some options up here for the display. So we can say last six hours and I'm going to change this to say last 24 hours. So it's a 24 hour period. And look at this. We've got a really big spike right here. Now if you were watching my live stream this morning as in the day that I'm actually filming this video right now, it's a few hours after I did a live stream where I soldered on the live stream. And if we look at the chart right here, look at this time. This was just after 10 o'clock when I turned on the soldering iron. It was quite near the start of the live stream. And you can see that the PPD count has gone through the roof. So the air quality sensor, which is sitting over in the corner, a fair way from my workbench, has immediately picked up the fact that I turned on my soldering iron and there are measurable particles in the air as a result of that. That sort of thing is really interesting to see in a chart like this. There are also some other options up here in relation to refreshing. You can just click to manually refresh the dashboard. 
or you can come up here and you can specify a refresh frequency. So if we click 1M, this chart will update automatically every minute. That way you can create a dashboard with multiple widgets on it and the widgets will update automatically. As new data comes in, you will see the charts update over time and you don't have to do it by clicking the refresh button every time. And you can specify how frequently you want that to happen. So just as an example of another view, let's come up here and say add a panel and I am going to make this one use the same data source. I just want this as a different representation of the same information. So I'm going to select the same data source there. At the moment it looks the same as the other one but I'm going to come over here to visualization and I'm going to change it to being a gauge just for a bit of an interesting different way of seeing it. And if we come up to field, we can see some options that change the way it behaves. So let's set a threshold. I'm going to say that anything that is over 300, it should go red. And up to that, it should be green. And that's just a number that I made up for the sake of this. But you can use this to customize the way these charts are displayed. And you can have multiple thresholds. So I will just apply that. And now we have a chart. And if you come up to the top here where the title is, I didn't put a title on this one, we can click the side of it, drag it across, and we can rearrange our dashboard. So now we can have this fuel gauge style display, which just shows the current value right next to a chart showing that same parameter over a 24 hour period. As you've seen, Grafana is very powerful and flexible. It gives you lots of options for different ways of visualizing the data. What you can do is create different dashboards for different purposes. For example, perhaps you have an old iPad or an Android tablet attached to the wall and you want to display environmental data. What you could do is create a dashboard specifically for that device with just the data that you want to display and then create different dashboards for other purposes. Now, just before we finish up with Grafana, there's one final little thing we need to change just to make this look a little bit nicer. Now, down under the bottom of this chart, it's got this key and it has this auto-generated label, which isn't very nice. If you want to change any of the parameters of these existing widgets, come up to the top, click the little spin down, and select Edit. Now we're back in the window that we were in when we set this up in the first place. So if we come down here and we can see the A parameter, there is an option here for alias by. So I can say PPD 0.3, just change that as an alias, and you'll see that the label under the chart has changed. So I'll come down to this other one, change this to PPD 0.5. And now the labels here start to make sense. So we'll click apply and that will bring us back to the dashboard. Now don't click away. This is something that has caught me out several times. This isn't saved yet. So come up here to the top the little disk icon, click on save dashboard. I'm going to call this one air quality and save. So that dashboard is now saved and it will be available whenever we log into Grafana. If you don't do that last step, the dashboard will disappear when you close the browser, and you don't want that. If you're an experienced Grafana user, you may be wondering why I didn't use Telegraph in this project. Telegraph is a front end to Grafana that allows it to acquire data from different types of sensors. It would take the place of Node-RED and possibly even MQTT, so what we could do is reduce our software stack from four items down to three. In some situations, that might be the right software stack, so it's definitely worth looking into. But the reason that I used Node-RED and MQTT is that they are very useful in other tasks that you might want to do in part of your automation system. It's really common to set up automations, logic and rules and data transformations in Node-RED. So having it as part of your software stack is very useful. This video has been pretty long and it's been quite painful setting up all of these different items. But now that they're done, you've got a platform that you can use to take data from all sorts of different places and make decisions on it not just log it and report it. So what you can do is build dashboards for different purposes. And I really want to see the sorts of things that you come up with. So if you build some kind of a custom dashboard or you set up some kind of a data logging project, please come along to the Superhouse Discord server and share what you've done. I'd love to see it. Now, go and make something awesome.